In 2001, another German study caused such outrage that all mention of it was banned in some Islamic countries. A book appeared written by an expert in early Semitic languages. It was so controversial that the author published under a pseudonym and will only speak on condition that his identity remains concealed. So gesehen ist es unbedingt erforderlich, den Koran neu zu lesen. In order to understand it correctly, we need a fundamentally new interpretation and reading of the Quran. Dr. Marcus Gross helped to translate the book from its original German into English and is willing, openly, to express the author's views. Es wurde schon gesagt, 20 percent ich würde sagen, 25 percent About a quarter or a fifth of the Quran contains unintelligible words or words which don't make real sense. That number can be vastly reduced with the knowledge of Syriac to, let's say, 5%. Syriac, or Syrio-Aramaic, had become one of the dominant languages of Christian liturgy by the third century. Christ spoke Aramaic, and it can still be heard in remote Christian communities like this town of Malula in Syria. But at the time of Muhammad, Syrio-Aramaic was the major written and cultural language of the whole region. Written Arabic was in its infancy. Wir haben bis zum Koran einige Inschriften. There are uh, pre-Islamic uh, inscriptions in Arabic, very short texts, but the first real book written in Arabic uh, is the Koran. But you're saying the Koran is written in two languages. Ja, ich würde sagen, Es gibt ja kaum eine Kultursprache von in many areas in the world, languages mix constantly, all the time. Denn eine to make it understandable to a speaker of English, you have to go back about a thousand years. Imagine the Anglo-Saxon peasant talking to his master, who was a Norman, and spoke a mixed language of French and an Anglo-Saxon. And you could only understand that mixed language with the knowledge of both. Muslim scholars of the past had the confidence to acknowledge foreign words in the Quran. In the 10th century, Al-Tabari, one of the most respected commentators, identified Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Persian, Abyssinian, and Syriac words. The difference, though, is that Luxembourg is claiming new meanings that have never been suggested before. How can one German professor challenge the collective judgment of more than a billion people, and on what basis? What method? Does he use? Ich bin natürlich bemüht, zunächst einmal eine arabische Lesung und eine arabische Whenever I try to find a solution for an unclear passage, the first step is to try to find an overlooked meaning of an Arabic word which is not used today, but which can be found in old dictionaries, something that the commentators didn't consider. Only if that is not possible, I take into consideration the meaning of the root, the, of the corresponding root in Syriac, or a possible misreading. Misreading in this case means that the undotted text was dotted wrongly. Then there's also the possibility that a Syriac letter was by mistake written with, within an Arabic text. Using these methods, Luxembourg examines some of the most obscure passages of the Quran. After Mary has given birth to Jesus, in the Arabic Quran, the archangel says to her, be not sad, your Lord has placed a little river beneath you. In Luxembourg's version, be not sad, your Lord has made your delivery legitimate. And there are other highly contentious examples. God's command to a skeptic in Arabic, look at your food and drink, look at your ass, becomes look at your condition and look at your overall state. At the end of the world, the earth steps forward in Arabic. In Syriac, the earth splits open. Plausible to some, but do any of these changes affect the central precepts of Islam? Or is Luxembourg just adding a little poetic color here and there? Meine, was äh, soziale Gepflogenheiten angeht, wie zum Beispiel It's certainly not key precepts like the existence of God or afterlife, which is challenged by my interpretation, but many everyday customs. 
One example is the, the veil. The Quranic verse adduced to prove their position talked about humur, which had to be beaten on the pockets. The sentence was a bit obscure. It's usually rendered that it means cover your head and your cleavage. And if you have a look at uh, the, the chador, the, the veil in uh, Iran, for example, that's exactly what is covered. Aramish, Gmar, and ich ein Gürtel. But with my Syriac interpretation of the verse, my translation is put your belt around your hips. And the belt was a sign of chastity, also especially used by monks. So that makes it much more meaningful. But Luxembourg's interpretation of paradise causes the greatest offense. In the Iranian city of Isfahan, there's a 17th century palace built to represent the gates of heaven. The cool greens of the gardens beyond express the longings of a desert people and are beautifully described in the Quran, along with flowing fountains and the favors of Huris, usually understood as wide-eyed virgins. One commentary, but not the Quran, even specifies numbers, 72 for each righteous man. But that doesn't sit well with seven verses of the Quran that promise the righteous eternal contentment with their wives. Luxembourg believes he has resolved this contradiction. Mit weiß groß äugigen Huris verheiraten. There is one passage in the Quran dealing with the, with the Huris uh, in which it says, We have paired them with dark, wide-eyed maidens. That is the traditional understanding of this verse. If you put the dots on the undotted text a little bit differently, what comes out is, We will make you comfortable under white, crystal clear grapes. For the suicide bomber then, not the prospect of 72 virgins in paradise, but in Luxembourg's interpretation, a modest bunch of grapes. A German study, as far as I'm concerned, is very Christian-centric. Um, it's uh, influenced by the way Bible has been researched and put together. Bible and the Quran are not the same. It is the connection Luxembourg makes with Christian symbolism that is highly inflammatory to many, but a persuasive argument to others. This 5th century fresco in an Egyptian monastery depicts the archangels receiving souls in paradise. Each archangel holds a grape in one hand and in the other cradles the departed souls who are refreshed with bunches of grapes. The grape motif is repeated in the vestments of the priests of the Syrian Orthodox Church. All relating back to Christ's promise to his disciples at the Last Supper that he will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until he is reunited with them in his Father's kingdom. If foreign words were in the Arabic dictionary at the time of the Prophet, surely they, have, they had evolved into an Arabic meaning. So that particular word, even if it is Syriac, must be understood in the way the Arabs understood them. Not as grapes, but as hur, partners in heaven. I think we all understand that it's, it's symbolic, that we have to go beyond the images and the way we look at the, uh, at the paradise, for example. You know, we are not asked to, to think of this on, you know, in a literal way, it's, this is what is... We don't know, it's just for us a description of what is going to be beautiful beyond your imagination. Although Luxembourg's work has been called into question by leading academics and is controversial by its very nature, he believes it opens a door, encouraging linguists, archaeologists and historians to use modern tools to throw further light on the text and its context. For some Muslim scholars, that is in the Quranic spirit of free inquiry and no threat to those who are robust in their faith. This research by Luxembourg and his colleague, colleagues doesn't undermine any of the basic tenets, teachings or principles of Islam. What it does though is to provide interesting questions and we as thinking Muslims, as people of the 21st century, that we should say, yes, let's look at what he's providing. Let's not just condemn, 
But let's also see uh, if, if this research has a historical base or is it a product of European Orientalism. Mm -hmm.